When did you first start at Bristol, Bristol Aeroplane Company? Uh, I started in the car division. Ju June the 19th, 1945. Yes. And uh, my, f my first job was uh, doing a little bit of work on the uh, Brabazon. Yes. Detail work. And when the first car came around, then I did all the electrical work on it. Tell me about that. How did that? How did you manage that? Well, do the electrical work. Yes. Oh, well, take them, measure it, and decide what um, uh, lamps, or decide what relay, or anything like that. Check the current consumption, and make sure I had the right gauge wire. Because you then, had a... then I would lay it out on a table. I do all my design work at home. Yes. And then I would lay it, come in, lay it out on the table, and put the cables in and do the terminations. You know. So you'd be making what we'd call the wiring looms. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You had an electrical background, didn't you? I was sure my time at Lucas's. Then I, then I was at Hackney Technical College and. All them so tech. Yes, that was before the war, I guess. No, that was during the war. During the war, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then I was a radar technician. Right. Finished up as a radar technician. And then um, I was given a choice of having a commission or I could go to Marconi Research Department in Pendine. Right, Marconi. I, I went down there for three years. Yes. And I was checking the velocity of of bullets from various guns, aircraft, RAF, uh, our Royal Artillery, the Navy. So you'd, you'd measure that by radar, would you? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes I, had a, I had a good little number down there. I was um, virtually in charge of that department. Mm -hmm. but, uh, of course, the civilians were down there. They'd been down there for some consider considerable time and uh, earning good money. And I was a shilling a day man. Right. <laughs> This is the problem. It used to annoy me, but now I could do nothing about it. Mm. Well, they had they had cushy jobs. Oh yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But you were you were but you were in the army later on. I was in the army before. I see. I, you were seconded there. I well, what happened? I, I, I was called up and I joined the Royal, Royal Engineers. Yes. And we mined the coast from Dover up to Bungay. Then I was transferred to the RAOC. Then I was transferred to Remy. Mm. Then I went to the Royal to um, uh, Coldstream Guards. Yes. To become an officer. Right. And it was there that I had uh, a serious illness. Oh yes. Uh, and when I recovered, I was unable to do any service work, like go out fighting, anything like that. Mm. Uh, so um, they sent me to Hackney Technical College. I was there six months. I was at Walthamstow Technical College for three months. Then I went to the Military College of Science for three months in Bury, And then I went to Lowestoft. Mm to take my final exams and it was from there they sent me down to Pendine to mark on a research department so this gave you this all this gave you a good grounding in electrical yes uh, matters electronics too i suppose well, the reason the reason i went they wanted elect people with electronic knowledge mm. and i'd already had that um but really, to qualify, you had to be a BSc man. I, I didn't have the BSc. Right. But I went down there, and um, there was something like 90 hours on the course, and at the end, there was 28 passed. Right, right. It was pretty That's, rigorous. You had exams every month. Yes. And if you didn't make the grade, you'd be thrown out. That's the background. So that brings us to late 1945. I was demobbed in 1946. Mm. And I came straight up to Bristol Airplane Company and I was interviewed because mm. they didn't have an electrical engineer in those days, yes. strange as it may seem. Um, 
I first started, when I started there, I was given the job of doing detail work on the Brabazon, and also I was um, servicing receivers from Flight Ops. Oh, yes. You see? And then, of course, I went there to work on motor cars. The first one came along, and there was no electrical engineer around. So I measured everything up, and I did that one. So that was uh, the first 400? That was the very first one, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Who was in the factory at the time? Can you recall? In, in the factory, there was a senior man by the name of Mr. Holbrook. Um, the manager's name was Mr. Williams. Yes. But in those days, you would have a manager nearly every, every six months. Right, they'd come and because go. Because they didn't qualify. They did, didn't know anything about motor cars. Yes. Luckily, I was in a position where people would come to me for advice. Yes. Uh, you heard of Sidney Gibbons? Indeed. Well, he was transferred from aircraft to motor cars. And I used to um, reply to all his letters. Mm. And I used to teach him everything about motor cars. Mm. Because the aircraft company wouldn't have had that expertise, I understand. No, no one knew much about motor cars. That's the problem. Mm. Mm. I was a king dick, so to speak, there at the time. Yes. And... Uh, well, uh, I tried to help everybody as I did. And, um, How many people worked in the car division at that time? Oh, something like 300 people. Right. Because they were making the bodies. Yes. And they were making the panel work, the shells, as they called them. Yes. Uh, in, in those days, you, you worked on a bonus principle. Right. Um, the, the head, the head people used to give us so much money to produce the motor car. Mm. The tinsmiths would have the first choice. <laughs> then it would be the um, paint shop. Yes. Then the fitters. And by the time it came to us to assemble the cars, there was hardly anything there. Right. So you had to work flat out to get your money in those days. But everything you did had to be inspected as though it was an aircraft. Yes. And the finish of a Bristol 400 was far ahead of anything that was on the road in those days. Mm -hmm. It was a really good made motor car. And I notice when I take my 400 apart, I, I, I'll see in, I'll see, how, I'll see signatures inside panels and marks made, and I suppose those are made by inspectors. Well, of course, the underside of the car, as far as I know, was standard on every car we made. Mm. There were no changes. So if you've had any changes on your car, yes, it's. It wasn't done at the factory. Let's right. Put it that way. Right. Right. You must have seen um, the BMW people who were the, working there at the time. Yeah. Well, there weren't there weren't many. Um, BM, BMW. Well, I think it was about three people. Yes. Something like that. Because they brought, they brought them over from the factory, didn't no, they? No, they didn't bring them ah. over, no, no. What's the, the true story? The engines came over by what happened was three men of Bristol yes. flew over to get the engines. Yes. And I, I know one of the men, he's dead now, that was Mr. Froud. Froud, yes. He, he, was, he was one of them. And there was a Mr. Mayhew. Now, Mr. Mayhew was, at that particular time, he was manager of the spares department. Mm -hmm. He organised everything as regards how to make a motor car, the material we needed and everything like that. 
he was a wonderful man. But uh, for some unknown reason, he left the company and uh, he went to Shroud to work as a general manager of a big place over there. So they, they, fl they flew over from, from Filton to Munich? Yes, and brought the engines back. Yes. What did they fly in? Oh, I don't know, to be frank no. with you, no. Uh, but unfortunately, he's not here, otherwise I could ask no, him. No, no. So it was, it was three, of, three of the workforce went? That's right, yes. yes. There were no, no BMW men involved. Right, right. They just collected the engines and brought them over. Okay. And you had a designer from BMW, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was it Mr. F was it Mr. Fiedler? Yes, it really was. Mm. Yeah. Um, see now. When 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 the engines came over, a lot of work had already been started on engines. Right. Because they'd already had drawings to start on the engines. Yes. It's not a case of, well, we copied that, we copied that, we copied that. Granted, they did copy some of the things, mm -hmm. but the engines were being made before the engines came over from Germany. Right, right. We had the proper design team doing it. What differences were there between a, a Filton-made engine in those days and a BMW-made engine? I, I, I honestly, I wouldn't like to say. Mm, mm. I can't. I can't remember everything, and I, I wasn't too involved with the engines in those days because I had so many other jobs to do. Yes, yes. So, so what were your what were your other responsibilities then? It sounds like you were very busy. What was my responsibility? Yes, apart from the uh, apart from the electrician, the well, electrical I, work. I started running the shop actually. Right. Not not from the start. When Mr. Holbrook was there, he was the he was the works manager, mm. but um, I took over from there when he left. But uh, I don't know what, what date that was. I, I I know I went on the staff in 1951. Yes. But I, I still wasn't running the place then because mm. Mr. Holbrook was there. So I, that. So I that would say it's about 19, something like 1970, something like that when I when I had the position of superintendent. Right, right. So coming back to the 1950s, that was the, four, the 400 model. Yes. Um, how did the 401 come along? Well, the, four, the 401 was introduced because the 400 was not big enough mm. and not fast enough mm. and it was decided then that the 401 would be a, 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 lit, a lot bigger inside yes. and to have a an updated engine in other words so, yeah, we had as you know we had various series of engines bm the, we had the b and the aa and the c and there was some um, various pistons used um, it's difficult to remember everything, but I know that every every modification that was done to the engines were done to improve the performance. Yes. And we had wonderful engineers in those days. So they weren't modifying the engine to reduce the price. They were modifying it to increase the quality and increase the out, the, the output. Yes, yeah. yes. And that was the that was the principle they worked to. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Hence the price of a Bristol, of course. Mm. But they were wonderful engineers. The, there was an Italian input to the 401 design. Did you meet the Italians when they came over? The, four, the 401s, well, they were designed by Bristol Cars. Yes. The, but the, the panel works were, were made in Bristol Cars as well. Yes. And touring Milano made some, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them prototypes, um, but they made, they made some cars on a Bristol chassis that were then developed into the 401. Well, I don't know anything about that. 
Right, right. Okay. So I can't answer it. Um, so that's you see, well, the engine division. First of all, we had the big factory for producing. Yes. Then further up the hill, we had another factory that made front suspensions and rear suspensions. Yes. And then we had another place where they did all the development work. Yes. And then across the road, the designers were designing parts for this and that. And of course, you couldn't be everywhere at the same time. How many designers were there for the 400, for example? For the four, something like 16. Right. So a big, a big, a big team of designers, draftsmen. Design, yeah, designers and draftsmen they were. Yes. And we had Dudley Hobbs, and then we had a chap by the name of Taffy Thomas. He was he was very very good on the body. Yes. And then Dennis Sevier came along, and he was a wonderful engineer. Yes. Um, we had a lot of um, people from university. They would come. They didn't seem to last very long. No, right, they, right. they only came for experience, and then they, when they get an old, a, a certain amount of knowledge, then they would just leave us. What about top management? Did you see much to, of them? To, top management. We had um, Sir George White. Yes. And we had Major Abel. Did you mm. know about Major Abel? They were the two big noses in those days, mm. and. Um, Major Abel was a very, very good man. But of course, as the company expanded, they put other people on. That, uh, um, they put Selby on, as a, yes. as a sales, kind of a, a sales manager, put it that way. And then we had uh, a man come over from uh, Australia, Sidney Bircher. Right. He was a machine expert over in Australia. He didn't have much knowledge on motor cars, mm. uh, but he took over as manager. And it's true to say that I would spend various nights a week with him, teaching him his job. Right. He would come to my house every Sunday morning and we would have a session. I would go to his house. Uh, I told him to drive, for he was a wonderful man. Unfortunately, he had cancer and he, he died. And Sidney Gibbons took over then. Yes, yes. Um, well, we, we had quite a few changes in those days, and I, to be frank, I can't remember everything. You know. Well, it was a it was a big it was a big company with three hundred workers at the time. Three hundred on the workforce. Well, it was the the panel shop. It took us so many workers, and and in those days we had a big uh, department for um, doing detail work. Yes. We had a hell of a big machine shop. The machines and the work they had to do in those days. Oh yes, it's over okay. three hundred people. It was so, were these all were these all aircraft workers that had come across? No, no, some were, but yes. majority of them were outsiders coming in. Right, right. Yeah, we had uh, ex footballer called Jock Ray. He was in charge of the of the fitters, and we had um, a Canadian on inspection. Mm. And we had a chief inspector called Fred Sawyers. Sawyers, yeah. yes. He was an aircraft man. But uh, he didn't seem to last very long. Uh, I think he took an early retirement. Do you know anything about the finances? Was, were the cars a financial success at that time? The finance side of it, uh, I didn't have anything to do with that at, at, at that time. But they had um, one, two, they had about nine people on the finance side. Right, in the office. Over in Sammy Shields' place it was, the laundry. Yes, yes. We didn't see much of them in those days. So we're in the early 50s, the 401 models come out, as you say, bigger, more powerful, the 403. 
Yeah. More powerful again. Yeah, well, we, we did the, we did 402s. Yes. And we made a few of those. Do you, do you, uh, remember, many. Do you remember any of the customers for the 402? I, I can't remember what size engine we put in them in those days. Yes. But, uh, but the 402s was, in my opinion, a lovely motor car, but they didn't make many of them. Mm -hmm. Same as the, uh, the 404s. Now, if we'd have made a lot of those, we would have been well away. But as you know, 404s are very, very expensive today. Yes. Um, coming back to the 402, I, th I think uh, some American film stars bought them, didn't they? Gene Simmons, and Richard, yes, uh, I met them. And Stuart. They Stuart. were very. Gene was very, very nice to all of us. Yes. She really was. Uh, came into the shop, talking to everybody. You wouldn't think they were anybody. Stuart Granger was the same. Yes. They had one each, didn't they? If yes. I remember rightly, yes. that's right. And um, uh, something happened. Uh, they, they sold them, let's yes. put it that way, whether it's because like, they couldn't imp import them to America, I, I just don't know. I was... Was there, an, was there a little accident um, when, they were, when they were taking them away? No, and all, all I know is that they got caught in a, a rainstorm. <laughs> right. And uh, they had difficulty in getting the, the hood up. Right. And they got annoyed and threw some of the parts <laughs> in the hedge, of which we went got later on. Right. But I don't know much about that, you know. Right, right. Now, when, when we were doing the 403s, I had another job to do. Yes. And I was, I was given the job to make gun turrets. Oh, yes. Uh, I employed 22 women on that job. Right, right. Um, and then I had the Britannia leading edges to wire up. Right. I had a certain amount of people on that. So, you know, a lot of things happened to the motor cars that I was not aware of, so long as I did all the electrical work, or at least not me. I had three men on electrical work, and um, the cars were going out. I gave me more time on the turret controls. So you 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 you'd be switched across depending on where the aeroplane company wanted you. Yeah. Yes, during 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 that time, I'm. They, they started the um, guided weapons. Oh, yes. And I had two directors come down to see me, and they offered me the job of managing director. Right. But I, I turned that down. My love was motor cars. Right, right. And then I had um, another director of another company come and ask me to leave and work for them, but that was Jensen's. Right. And they soon went into liquidation, didn't they? Well, they did, they did quite well through the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, was it the mid-70s they went bust? Something like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. but I, I, would, I wouldn't accept a job. Mm -hmm. My wife didn't want me to. She said, well, the two children will go to university and we can manage, and uh, mm -hmm. that was it. Mm -hmm. So... We've got. We've mentioned the 404, the short wheelbase one. Did you have anything to do with the Arnold Bristol? Arnold, you walk the Arnold. Yes. Um, well, I didn't have much to do with them. They did the bodywork. Yes. And they did a reasonably good job, as you know. I think they did anyway. Yes. But, uh, yes. No, I, I didn't have much to do with that. That was kind of the design side took over that job. Yes. But, um, so that's the that's the 404, the Arnold, then the first four door saloon, the only four door saloon, the 405. Yeah. The 406. Um, did you have much to do with the development of those? The 406. Only the electrical. Yes. That's yes. Right. I used to. Uh, I would, as I said, I, I would do design work at home, and I would I would get up early and get up to Stafford and 
um, cover the complete installation in one one day. Right. But up there, they were only wiremen. They they didn't know how a relay worked or anything. Right. They always had a blackboard and easel ready for me, and I used to teach them. Right. And they they always said I was absolutely stupid to to work where I was working when there was other chances of promotion with my knowledge. But, uh, so you design the you design the wiring loom. Yeah. You take you take it up to Stafford, and they would then they would then produce it. What would happen? I would produce all the drawings. Yes. Size of cable, terminations, yes. the length, any connection, it would all be shown on my drawings. Yes. And they would work to that. And they said that, that if they would make one off for me to try out, but if it was uh, designed by the big companies, mm -hmm. they would have five men doing this, five men doing that. And they would make as many as seven pre-production cable harnesses right. to get perfection. Yes. But I only had it one day to do it. And right. Uh, right. They all worked out all right. I, uh, so yours, yours had to be right first time. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was all right. Well, we've got, so talking it through, we're in the 1960s now. The decision's been made to use a Chrysler V8 in the, on the Bristol chassis? Yes, that, that I remember the first engine coming over and it was fitted to a car in the shield, Sammy Shields place, you know, oh, over yes. the other side of the road. Uh, they fitted the engine, then they, they called me over because it had a certain amount of electronic stuff on there. Oh, yes. And there was no circuit diagrams or anything. So I sorted that one out. Then I, uh, of course, I made looms up for all future use. Now, the engine that they, the first engine, um, Sir George tried out. Yes. Uh, Dudley Hobbs tried it out. And uh, they were all impressed with it. A simple reason was the two-litre engine would not go over the 100 miles an hour. Mm, mm. And manufacturers of other cars now were over the 100 miles an hour business. Mm. Did you know that? Yes, that, so Jaguar, that is, for example. That is why, basically, we went over the American engine. Yes. Because it was a big, big redundancy. The machine shop, there was machines that were virtually given away. It was pathetic. So when you stopped making the two-litre engine, of course, the whole engine line shut right. down Yeah. and the machine shop. Yeah, well, there was a lot of machine work on front suspensions and rear suspensions. Yes. But that was when the rot set in, so to speak, you know. Uh, um, it's a shame, really, but... Uh, What's Obvi that? Obviously, we kept a certain amount of people behind, but not not a lot. How many did you lose? Do you know? Can, do you no. recall? No, I don't. Not not in this machine shop. No, no idea. Was the first engine? Were these American? These Chry Canadian Chrysler V8s? Were they tuned or developed at all by Bristol Cars, or were they fitted as as is? I, I understand they were just standard motor cars from yeah. the stage. Yes, that's what I was told anyway. But, uh, standard of course, in, in those days, you you didn't get to know much because it was kind of secret work, in other words. You know. Yes. Um, they were, factory was away from ours, and you, you didn't get to know much in those days. Right, right. It was, you know, as long as you could assemble the cars, the, the bodies that we were making and painting them and fitting them out, of which, you know, we... We were very good at that. Uh, we didn't know much about engines and uh, various things like that. Uh, did you get repair work in to do? Did I? Get repair work? No, we had a service department for that. Right. No, right. Nothing to do with us. No. So the V8, the V8 has come into being. Um, 
Were any other engines tried out before the V8? Do you remember that? I, I heard that they had tried an engine which was not satisfactory. What it was, I don't know. Mm, mm. I can't help you on that. Okay. Um, I've seen one Armstrong engine, Bristol, with Armstrong Sidley engine. Might well, have been that one. Dennis, Dennis Sevier, he, he designed a new engine. Yes. But nothing came of it. Yes. Was I don't know why. Was um, so the one that's the 160 project. Was um, was it ever built? No, no. It was designed, but it was not as far as I know. It was never built. Yes, yes. And that was to go on the 220 chassis. Yeah, yeah. Did you, which did drive as a prototype? Did you did you drive that chassis, the 220? Yes. What was it like? Very good mm. in those days, mm. yeah. What was special about it? Well, performance, really. Yes. It was really uh, a nice engine. And, um, and the suspension? Suspension was virtually... Well, it was a, it was a modded from suspension, as you know. Yes. And, well, it made the car... Not a saloon car, but not a racing car, but a kind of a saloon car. Yes. That's the difference between one and the other. The front suspension was marvellous. The rear axle was marvellous. Yes, and, uh, and disc brakes on the rear and so on. Yeah, well, the Bristol cars did a lot of design work on disc brakes. Yes. Uh, like with Lucas, for example, if they introduced relays or a starter or a motor or dynamo, they would always send one down for me to try out. Right, right. And the same applies to the brakes. We had specialists kind of supervising the, uh, the brakes. And um, we were virtually the first people on the market to have four disc brakes. Yes. Yes. Um, I can't, we can't go past the two litre cars without mentioning the racing project, the 450. Did you see much of that? The 450, well, as I said, I, uh, I used to work during the evenings on doing all the electrical work on those. Yes. Um, the 450s, we had two engineers, Percy Chemist was one. I've forgotten the name of the other man. They were absolute mustards. And they built the car over in Sam Hill's place. Yes. Um, Dave Summers was the chief designer. Yes. And we finished the work on one of them at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And David couldn't drive. So I took it out on the runway at two o'clock in the morning. How did it go? Well, I had made a mistake. I didn't have any earmuffs. Right. It was so noisy, but it went like a rocket. It really yes, did. Yes. But the lighting was not much good. And Percy Chemist said to me, you've got to do something about the lighting because we can never win anything because, you know, it's an old 24-hour job. Um, the lighting is no good. Well, I said, it's standard lamps from Lucas. Mm. There's nothing special. I said, the only way I can improve the lamps is, is wire them direct to the dynamo. But I said, I can't guarantee that the lights are going to last. Yes. Anyway, I did that. He said, do that. So I, I did that. And uh, he had brilliant lights all the way through. Right. And not one roll went. Right, right, uh, right. Okay. A lot of things have happened that I, I honestly I can't remember. But uh, if David so Dave Summers was here, he would... He, he was responsible for the design of that car. Not Dudley Hobbs or anybody. Right. Just Dave Summers. And um, he was a wonderful man. So that was 53, 54. Well, you, you're quoting dates. I, I can't remember those dates, but of course, 19... when, whenever it was. And 55 was the last, last season they raced because of oh. the disaster at Le Mans. Uh, I can't even remember that because I didn't go over. Yes. Um, I remember them being loaded, and I remember Sidney Gibbons, one of them, going out for spares. 
Yes. He went out with it, and uh, apparently um, everything went all right. Yes. yes. And Sir George decided, right, we've won everything. We want no more racing. Mm. What happened to them then? Well, they were broken up apart from one. Yes. I was told there was two, but as far as I know, there was only one. And that, that one came back, and after a long period of time, it was sold to a customer. Yes. And it was my job then to get it on the road and get it through PCA. Yes. And get a license for it. So we had to put new lamps, we had to put flashers on it. Yes, yes. It was, uh, but it was worth it. It was a nice show. Yes, yes. But the 450 S was a was a good motor car, and I wish Sir George had right, said, "Right, let's go into racing." Yes. But he, but he didn't. Yes. It's something to do with money, I presume. I, I don't know. Cause it does cost a lot of money, as you know. It does. It does. Well, so we've, we've got to the 1960s, we've got to the, um, the V8s, um, 407, 408, 409. Well, the 407s was, was not, in my opinion, a very good motor car. Right. It was, it was too heavy, mm. there was no power steering, mm. and needed a lot of things doing to it. Yes. Um, that virtually is why we went to the next model. As you know, we had uh, power steering on those and made all the difference in the world. And smaller, um, yeah. and smaller wheels. Yeah. Yes. Um, so. 408, 409, 410. The models, the models gently well, evolved. It was just models, wasn't it? They yes. couldn't face lips all the way through. Yes. Yes. But. Um, for the 411 Series 5, I consider it one of the best cars on the road in those days. Yes, yes. It was magnificent. What makes you say that? Well, the performance, the brakes, and uh, the handling of the thing, it was like handling a little sports car. Yes. I expect you've driven one anyway. I have, yes, they feel... And it was just like a sports car. It was so easy to drive, wasn't it? Yes, yes. It's, um, it's such a shame that we didn't carry on and do other facelifts to it because we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. Yes, yes. So the, four, the 411 that evolved into its final final version, really. You know, well, the 411s, it was all facelifts, you know, a little bit here and a little bit mm. there. Um, then again, we had the Italians uh, well, with the Zagato you know, design, 412. Yeah. Well, Sevier and I went over to Zagato's uh, to tell them what we wanted. Yes. Because their workmanship was rubbish, actually. Right. Yeah, nothing fitted when the cars came over. Right, right. But Tony Crook was well in with Zagato, and he said, uh, we'll have these for America. Yes. And we, I think it was 21 we converted to left-hand drive. Right, right. And there was not one sold. Oh, goodness. So we had a job of putting them back to right-hand drives. Now, the 412s, were the best car that we ever produced from a road handling point of view. Right. That was, it was very, very good round bends and corners. It, um, was that because of the different weight balance? Well, I, I think it was design of the body, really. Yes. That's just my opinion. But, um, um, well, they were all sold, weren't they? People seemed happy with them. Yes, yes, yes. So the 412. Um, then we come to the 603. Well, the 603 was a venture that Tony Crook introduced. He'd only just... He didn't own the company when we did that. Sir George was still alive. Yes. But he convinced Sir George that they could do a 603. 
and it was a bodge job, really. Right. And it was such a bodge job that Dudley Hub said, I'm not working with that man anymore, and he left. Right. Taffy Thomas had cancer, he died. So really, the body side was all done by Zagata. Yes. We did the interior trim. Dennis Sevier, he supervised the engine and anything that he wanted doing on the mechanical side. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, the cars came over from Zagato with no engines, no gearboxes. It had a front suspension and a rear axle because we had to fit those before we sent the chassis over. Yes, yes. So I thought the 412s were a good car, really. But, uh, so, so that was the 412. Um, I suppose chronologically we come on to the Come on to the Blenheim next. Oh, I haven't mentioned the Bowfighter. The Bowfighter and the Blenheim. Well, the, the Bowfighter was a project done by Dennis Sevier. Yes. And Geoffrey Marsh did all the body work. Mm -hmm. um, I had an electrician to do all the electrical work on it. Yes. Because it was very involved what they wanted. But only one was made. Right. That was sold, and this thing has been sold several times to different different people. But uh, that was a very nice car. But Sevier was still alive in those days, and nothing would go through unless Sevier approved of it. See, Sevier was kind of responsible to the uh, ministry. Yes. Any modifications, he had to go down and see them for their approval. And they could come up to us at any time. Oh, I want the petrol tank taken out of that car. I mm. want to examine it. I want this taken out. Yes. Uh, it had to be right. And Sever always made sure it was right. As I told you, a better engineer I've never heard of than Sever. Um, so, apart, apart from that, well, the Zagatos never, never gave us much trouble. Yeah. We used to have slight water leaks occasionally, but nothing. Yes. Not like the, the fighter. That was the time the Beaufort came along. Mm. Can you say much about the Beaufort? As I said, we only made one of those. Yes, yes. And, um, the customers, all, they've all been delighted with them, apparently. Yes. Uh, so we've talked about the Bowfighter, we've talked about the Bowfoot. We're coming to the Blenheim. Again... Um, well, we didn't discuss the 603, really, did we? It's just not so much. The, 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 the 603, uh, the shape at the back was all wrong. Yes. The shape at the front was all wrong. And the, the air con was just a load of rubbish. Mm, mm. Um, it was not, in my opinion, a very good motor car. Mm. But we have modified some of them. As you know, we fitted a new heater box in, a complete new one. Uh, yeah, they, they were rushed out. No. At that particular time, Toby, no, Tony Crook stayed with us all night. Yes. To make sure he would take the first one up to the motor show. Right, right. He sold that car at the motor show and had never been on the road to do a proper road test. And he left the customer to sort out all the defects. And we did have, in those days, we had a good name, mm. but it went downhill. We produced a car that was no good. All because it had never been developed 
Right. Now, all the four elevens, or when the first one was introduced, that car would do something 22,000 miles. Mm. Various people would drive it of to find faults. Of development and testing. Yes, development, yes. yeah. Yes. Uh, but this 603 went from us to the stand, not road tested. Tony Cook took it up by road. Um, on the stand, sold it, never came back. Yes, yes. Until the customer found all the defects, and it came back to us to put right. So by this time, what was your position in the company? Director. You were you were director by then. Oh yeah. So they were works works director. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Um, what were production levels like, and what were the staffing levels like? The. Um, how many cars were you turning out? That I don't I don't know the exact number. I I could I could virtually tell you I've, I've got the book at home. I, I don't know how many we turned out, frankly. So, and how many staff were there by then? All together with the paint shop and, and the panel shop and the fitters, I would say getting on for 40 people. Yes, so it had, it had gone down from two to three hundred to about 40. Oh, yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Sir George White, Sir George White and well, Tony Crook were partners. Unfortunately, Sir George had an accident. Yes. It wasn't his fault, so I was told. Yes. And uh, eventually, Tony Crook took over the business. Yes. And the day he took the business, the day the business started to go downhill. Mm. Mm. He had the business, I think, for something like 10 to 12 years. The 603 did to him, virtually, what the fighters done to Toby Silverton. Right. It was cost a lot of money, and there was not so much sufficient money coming <coughs> back to replace the money they already used. Yes, yes. Um, what else? So we're getting into the the end of the 20th century now. Yes, yeah. Um, staff numbers have dropped. Production levels are, I imagine, quite low. Um, well, on, no, it's not. It's, this is before then. Yes. It's just before, yeah. Well, the 603 was the cause of the company going downhill fast. Right. Right. That was that. And then he realised that uh, the next car's got to be changed. Yes. There's a major facelift on that one. When the Blenheim came along... The Blenheim came along, yeah. What sort, of, uh, what sort of changes were made for the Blenheim? The body. Yes. Yeah. That was the main thing. The body, the dash virtually remained the same. Um, Front suspension was the same, rear axle was the same. It was the same door frames, the same quarter lights. Yes. The same. No, we had a rear, a rear screen was a different shape, different size. But not much. But it made all the difference between a 603 yes. and a decent motor car. Yes, yes. yes. And I. I the, all the Blenheims, in my opinion, were good motor cars. Mm -hmm. um, the Series 1, very, I thought was good, 2 or 3. Um, but the last, the last Blenheim we made, which was, I think, something like 16 of those. Yes. Toby Silverton spoiled. He said, I can improve this, I can improve that. So he designs a camshaft on the back of a matchbox. Mm. The camshaft came along, we fitted it, no engine would take over properly. Mm. And that is why a lot have been returned, because the engine's lumpy and you never know when it's going to cut, mm. cut out. Mm. Mm. 
But uh, all joking aside, other than the camshaft, in my opinion, the, Blenheim, the, the last Blenheim series we made were as good a car as any on the road today. Mm -hmm. I gave praise to the coach builders, the paint shop, the panel shop. Yeah. A lot of this was done by hand. You appreciate that. There was no such thing as pressing on some of the parts. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I, I have been proud of what they've done for me. But then the, the chief architect of the universe came down and took over the business. And um, so I just made a mess of everything he did. So Toby Silverton became a partner with Tony Crook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did, that, how did that go to start off with? Well, I understand I did, that, that, that they the day they came down to buy the business, yes. Tony Crook said to me, I want you to stay back Friday afternoon, stand by my side and nod to everything I say. Yes. And if I sell the motor car, if I sell the business, I will give you half of what I get for the company and you will be a rich man. Right. Well, he sold the business, and I never had one penny <laughs> because it was not in writing. Yes. But I don't hold that against him because um, I was doing the same before he sold the company as I've been doing the last three years. Mm -hmm. Put money out to buy parts to get the, the company going. So there was a shortage of cash at that time. <laughs> yeah, that's why he sold the business. And you, you, you'd be putting your hand in your pocket to tide things over. But mm -hmm. I guess you got your money back at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. You were so you were paying suppliers. Tires, anything. Yeah. Anything that was wanted, I was paying. Yes. So I could have been a rich man, but. Um, so Toby, Toby Silverton came along and. Toby Silverton bought the business. Bought a share. And he had he had Mr. Crook as his chairman. Yes. And um, the business was. Well, they were great friends for about three years, something like that. And um, the fighter came along, mm. as you know. And basically, he got rid of Toby because he couldn't sell fighters. Yes. Who can? Mm. No one. So, to start off with, they got on well. They were very, very Toby well. They used to come down and have sandwiches and cakes and drinks and bet I a shilling before father comes or a shilling for this. They were just like kids. Yes. Toby knew nothing whatsoever about design work. Right. Or how a car went up together. He didn't even know how many parts there were involved to make a motor car. Now all this all this came about was because uh, he decided that we were going to have a brand new motor car yes. and it was going to be fast, reliable, outstanding, beautiful to look at, a car that everyone, everyone would want. Yes. And we had a designer who was absolutely first class. That was Max Bockstrom. Yeah. He was a, a wonderful man and he came in, I'm not telling a lie, this is the gospel truth. He came into my office, he knocked on the door and he started walking up and down. You see animals in the zoo walking up and down. Yes. He was doing that and he was swearing. And he was a big, big man. I thought he was going to hit me. He said, I am giving you now my immediate notice to leave the company. Right. And I want to leave it today. I want you to accept it because I'm off this afternoon. I will not and I cannot work with Toby, Toby Silverton. Right. He knows nothing whatsoever about engineering, 
and he knows nothing about design. Yet he keeps poking his nose in and he's finding fault with my work. Right. So I said to him, now look, Matt, I said, you're putting me in the spot. We've got a delivery date for motor cars and now you're leaving. He said, whatever you say to me, I'm going. He said, I'll tell you something to your face. You're the only gentleman in Bristol cars. That was what he said to me. I didn't ask for him. Right. So he left. How, how far along had the project got by the time he oh, left? Oh, he was just on the, on the kind of the design of the, of the shape of the body. Right, right. So there was a lot of detail work to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so there was him, and the, did he have a draftsman, or it no. was just him? It was on his own, yeah. So when they designed the 400, you told me there were 16. When they designed the four? The 400, you said they were 16 in the, in the design shop. Yes. And to make the fighter, there was just one. Yeah. Yes. So, right, yeah. so you know, as a man of intelligence, where in the world is one man going to design a motor car? Mm. Mm. It just can't be done. Anyway, uh, I rang Toby and I said, uh, Max has just tendered his resignation. I've had to accept it because if I hadn't, he would still have gone. Mm. Oh, don't worry, said I'll get someone else. Mm. So he got someone else. Yes. He got a designer that had never worked on a production motor car in his life. Right. And he had never had any experience on designing detail work. Right. He was working for racing teams, in other words. Anyway, fair Jews, he, he worked hard and he had a couple of assistants mm. to give him a hand. And I said to him, well, you will never manage. Said, you won't be able to cover it all. I can cover it all on a computer, he said. I said, the computer won't mean anything. Mm. Not until it's actually built. And you can see what room you've got for seats, mm. whatever. Anyway, um, I always said, uh, I'll be able to do it. So uh, Toby used to come down and stay until late in the evenings, and I used to stay behind. And, uh, um, they, de they decided they wanted this, that, and the other. They wanted traction control. What did they have? They had a traction control, which was for an eight-cylinder car. Right. It had to be modified. It never worked. They had a, they had a sensor for the tires. That was off another car. It mm. never worked. And they they introduced switches, which were absolutely unobtainable. They were switches that were made for a German car, and they'd been out of production ten years. Mm. Anyway. The day came when he came into my office with Tony Crook was there. No, Toby was there and his father. And he said, oh, well, I am pleased to tell you that I finished the design work. Uh, I have another job to go to. I can give you a guarantee that everything will fit within two millimeters. Oh. I couldn't say anything, Toby was there. So Toby said, well, thank you for what you've done, shook hands, and away he went. And Silverton had the cheek to say to me, you've got one car to build our car, one, one, one week, rather. Mm. I want it on the road this time next week. Right. So he said, Doug, you better get going and look into it. So the first thing I did, I got the schedule. 75% of the parts had never been approved, hmm. and unless they'd been approved, they were not ordered. Right. So I took, I took the schedule home, I went through it, I thought, well, I'm never, ever going to do it. So I spoke to my secretary, Mrs. Herkett, hmm. and we were two long weekends, just the two of us, and every night, to make sense of the schedule. 
and to order parts so that we could build the car on. Some parts were unobtainable. They'd been out of production for years. So alternatives had to be found. There was no draftsman to do any fresh drawings for things that I needed. So Marsh, he'd come in, where's these effing parts for this effing car and all this kind of thing? And I tried to explain to him that he was like a bull at a fence. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do any more. I've worked every night this last fortnight till 10 o'clock. Lillian was the same. Work weekends, never got a thanks, never got a penny for it. Not that it worried me in those days, anyway. Um, he said, well, we'll never build it. I said, no, you won't. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we had uh, a so-called assistant who was going to take over my job. Yes. And his experience was down at Bristol City ground, and he was the, the man that used to run it on the pitch and attend to injuries. Oh, yes. I won't mention his name, but he came into the office. I explained to Toby about the schedule, and he looked at the schedule and said, do we need all these parts to make a car? I said, yeah, well, he said, I didn't know that. So this man came in and we were a row and he left. Well, eventually we ordered parts, which we had difficulty to get the money for. And we had parts designed and eventually we started to build the motor car. Yes. Silverton came up to me, he said, it's your fault, you, and your men haven't worked fast enough to build a motor car. Mm. So I said, don't be so bloody stupid. You know as well as, I do, as well as I do. You were responsible for the fighter. You told me that we were not to interfere. We were to build the last 10 blennings. And if you saw any of us looking at anything that they'd been designed or approved, so-called worked on, he would tell us off, you should be on the production, getting the Blenheims out, that kind of thing. Yes. So anyway, the, we eventually got the first one built. Uh, Tubby went out in it. Oh, clean it up, he said, and we'll let the customer have it. Tony Crook and Silverton took the car up to London, handed the car over to the customer and his wife, and on their journey home it rained and they both got absolutely saturated. Right. And when you lift the door Gullwind doors, there is a channel that is fitted bonded to the material, and it should fit inside the drain channel. Yes. They were two inches out of position. And we could do nothing about the bonded side of it. So we had to remake the drain channels. Mm -hmm. That took Marsh and two men three weeks to do. Right. So... That's an example of a, a design error, really. Yeah, that's the example of, of Toby Silverton's so-called design. Now, the car, as far as I'm concerned, is a kit cut car. You cannot stop the water leak. We've had, we had four cars that were eventually sold, all returned to us for water leaks. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say any more. It's just a load of rubbish. It's not a car built to the Bristol car's standard, in other words. Right. No one in those days would have accepted it. They would have 
they would have thrown the car out. But that's what I've had to deal with. Also the money side of it, there was no money to buy this, that or the other. No money to buy filters, oil, plugs, you name it. Pads so, for the gear, for the uh, brakes. So there was, there was my money all the time. There was a shortage of cash for running, um, really running the factory mm -hmm. for, for supply. There was a shortage of cash for supplies. Cash, cash was short. You weren't getting the cash you needed to run the factory. No. Right. No. So what did you do about that? Well, he could lose the factory, didn't he? Yes. Oh, well, what he did. But what did you do? Well, when, I kept putting money out, buying the stuff. How much did you put in? 40,000. 40,000. So this would be to suppliers. This is over a given period. Yes. yes. I told you about it, sending a car down because he'd sold it and it had to be painted. Yes. I told you about that. What happened? Well, the man painted the car, brought it in and was going to return it because he, we couldn't pay him. Right. And Mr. Binney said, oh, she said he'll pay, mm -hmm. which, which I did. Uh, Binny, the man he put on to make to put the company into liquidation. Yes. He was a bigger rogue than what Toby is. He looked after himself, money wise. Oh, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. But I would tell you that. Um, so you were just telling me that you wound up putting your own funds in to keep the company going during the clo during the last days. During, mm -hmm. during the end of the factory's life. Mm -hmm. Well, I never knew the company was going to liquidation. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did that come about? How did you hear? He came down mm. on, the, on the second and on the third he told me when I was up in London. Right, right. I never had a clue. Mm -hmm. So you, you were asked to go up to London? Yes, he told me to go to London. And there was not so much mo any money in the petty cash I had to put my own money out by the train fare and the taxis. Right, right. That's that's the situation. That's how did so you had to go back to Bristol and tell the workforce. No, no, he'd already sent uh, someone down to tell them. Yes. In my yes, absence. Yes, yes. So how did they handle it? Well, they could. There, some of them said, "Well, we could see this coming off." Yes. They all, you know. Uh, they all kept saying, well, how long can it go on with no mm -hmm. money? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, work, the workforce had realised there wasn't much to do. There was, there was a lot to do. We had five painted bodies on right. the shop floor. And we were waiting on parts from America. Mm -hmm. I'd asked him for those parts 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. And every time he came down, I asked him, when are we getting them? When are we getting them? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm looking into it, I'm looking into it. The last time he came down, I said, what about the parts from America? He said, what parts? You've never asked me to get any. I said, there's a notice on my table there, look, on, my, on the wall. Mm -hmm. The date that I told you what we wanted. Oh, I can't remember that, he said. He was the biggest liar God has ever made. I'm sorry to say that. But, uh, and he was the most despicable man I've ever met in my life. Thank you for putting the money out. I will make sure whatever happens, you will have your money back. Mm. And he sat down with his feet on the table and all he said to me, you've lost a lot. You've lost every penny. Mm. That was the truth. And I suppose you weren't down as a, you weren't down as a creditor for that in the, in the accounts because they weren't receipts. I had, I had from the um, receivers, a penny in every pound. Right, one penny in the pound. That's right, yeah, yeah. that's what I have. Now, I've, I'm in the process of writing this letter, and, and I'm going to say it, that I've been down to Bristol for information and they told me that the first thing they should do is pay the employees mm. if they put any money out yes. before anything. As first, first debtors, yes. But they didn't do anything. Yes. 
darkness of truth. What about your pen? What about your pension? Well, the pension I paid in since 1951. Yes. For my pension, and I also paid AVCs to make it. A, anyway, uh, what happened? This was in Cook's days. I'm not blaming Sheridan for this. Mm. In Cook's days, he was using all our money to keep the company going. And him, Crook and Durham decided the only way to get more money in is to put the workers into our staff fund. Right. Which they did. And for every three years service they'd done, they had a year's payment towards their pension. Yes. Then the insurance company decided, right, we need some money. We haven't had any money from you for years. So what they had to do was get a, a, a man in who was a specialist to sort the pension out. And all the money that the senior people like myself had put in went into a fund with the workers. Right? And it was all frozen until Crook paid the money back. Mm. Now, it was then decided, when the money was eventually paid back, that they would close the pension scheme, and they would get all the money that they had put into a pool and be divided amongst the workers and the staff. Right. The workers had only been in it a couple of years. They got more than what Lillian and I did. We didn't have a, we had enough to pay a postage stamp. <laughs> right. That's right. the truth. So are you getting a works pension now? Oh. No, 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 every penny's gone. Right, so no, no pension after how many years? 60? Um, so no pension after 64 years? Mm. Right. No. Well, when I say no pension, we're getting, we're getting enough to pay a postage stamp. Right. Lillian and I. Yes, yes. Disgraceful. Yes. When I was 65, I went to the Bristol Airplane Company to see the manager up there, and he worked my pension out. Mm. And my pension was £79 a week and a lump sum of £27,000. Okay, so that was thirty. That was twenty-eight, twenty-seven yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, back in nineteen eighty, I suppose. Mm, I lost lost every penny of that. Yes. Just Lily and I, and um, the only the only person that gained any money was Dennis's wife. Sevia. Dennis Sevia. Yeah. yeah. He died before he was sixty-five, and I took her out a cheque for sixty-five thousand pounds. Yes. yes. And then she said to me. Well, what, what do I do for my pension now? I said, I'm sorry, but you don't have a pension until you reach the age of 65, and this lump sum is in lieu of a pension. Yes. yes that was that. Yes. But they're the only one who's gained anything for it. So to start off with, you had, a, you had a final salary scheme in the early days, where it was a proportion of your final salary, is that right? We, we had the salary. Yes. And, and, that, and I think the company put 10% towards a pension. Yes. Something yes. like that. Yes. And then I put this seven and six a week, which was a lot of money in those days. Yes. A a AVCs. Yeah. But yes. um, it's all over and done with now. I, I don't, the pension side of it, uh, never get anything back now, um, apart from the postage stamp. What about redundancy? Did you get redundancy? No, that's the thing. I was never declared redundant, and yet I had notification to say there's a form coming for me to fill in yes redundancy payment yes so I rang Silverton up and I said what's the idea oh he said it's a mistake but he said use that mm -hmm. money to pay off some of the debts so when the money came in, it was the same as the workers. Yes. 
Well, if you're a director of a company, you should have double that amount of money. Mm -hmm. This is what I've been told. I rang ACAS up, but they, they didn't help me very much. Yes. Um, but Jeffrey did more about it, and um, they, f they short paid him £4,000, but he can do nothing about mm -hmm. it, so mm -hmm. just forget it. But looking ahead now, we're sitting in this we're sitting in this nice office in quite a large workshop with some with four Bristol cars out there being worked on by members of the workforce. What does the what does the future hold? What lies ahead? Well what lies ahead is that um We have to produce sufficient cars or renovations or service work yes. to keep it going. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And I have been told unofficially that um, they hope to get other makes of cars in for service, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing. Yes. Because, say, an Aston Martin came in. And you want it apart for you just get on the phone, you have it the next day. Yes. But if a Bristol came in and they wanted a front wing, you'd have to wait wait a week. Yes. To, to get it. the material in and to get one made. Yes. yes. I th I think I think he's got the right idea. I think he's a wonderful man, mm. and obviously, it's up to us all to pull our fingers out and do everything we can to make the company a success. Yes. That's my opinion, anyway. I think that's a very good note, maybe, to end on. Mm. Sid Lovesy, thank you so much, and my compliments and congratulations on giving such long and faithful service. Thank you very much, Sid. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.